So onwards, uh, it's going to be a real highlight of the afternoon. Screens everywhere, living in a multi-screen world, and it's going to be a conversation with Samsung. Samsung, frankly, doesn't need any introduction. It's taken the Android ecosystem by storm. Now has just over 60% share of devices on that platform. Incredible. Some other incredible stats, because we were digging around and look, looking for them, is like they've sold 250 million units across PCs, tablets, and smart devices in the last year. And get this, they sell two TVs a second. It's amazing. Also, I know that Samsung are putting a real lot of effort to support innovators and developers in that multi-screen environment, Galaxy Gear, you know, really getting developers thinking about you know, that multi-screen world. So with that, I have enormous pleasure inviting up Curtis Sasaki, who's head of Innovation Labs at Samsung. And he's going to have a conversation with Palmy Olsen at Forbes. Palmy, you should, uh, if you don't, uh, definitely follow and read her uh, Disruptors column. She covers mobile innovators in that, uh, that Disruptors column in Forbes. So it's a great read, I, I promise you. So come up on guys, uh, on stage guys. Big warm welcome for them. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, so, Curtis, you are Senior Vice President of Media Solutions for Samsung in America. Can you tell us a little bit about your role at the Innovation Lab and with Media Solutions, what that entails? Sure. It's kind of a weird name, so I apologize. <laughs> but uh, we have several functions. Uh, one function is uh, we actually create services specifically for North America. One of the services we launched at South by Southwest was called Milk Music. If you have a Samsung Galaxy device, give it a try. It's actually uh, pretty cool. Um, so we are, we're actually constantly coming up with new services that we think will appeal to consumers. Uh, we have a lot of analytics as well to make sure we know what consumers are actually using. Uh, we also have um, a group doing uh, developer outreach. So last year we had our very first developers conference in San Francisco, and uh, it was uh, very successful. And uh, we're going to have our second one also in San Francisco later this year. So that's an another part of the charter, and we provide a lot of technical support to developers you know, around the country. Um, and then we have um, you know, some folks actually doing uh, pretty innovative platform work as well. And we're going to talk about a little bit of what we're doing on that. Great. So um, a lot of what you do involves working, reaching out to developers, liaising with them, and I'm sure part of your job is also kind of enlightening them on the opportunity that exists um, in uh, developing not just for one screen, but for multiple screens. Right. Um, so my next question was going to be just about you know, setting the scene here. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, it was typical for an American household to have maybe one TV. And today, we've got six devices, maybe three. Uh, cell phones. Mm -hmm. um, so what does that mean in terms of this new era we're entering, in terms of how those screens start to work together? Okay. And what does that mean for developers as well? Yeah, so, you know, I think people here probably have already multiple screens. I see laptops and tablets and phones, and probably maybe some of you have watches. That's a lot of screens. So we did a little um, short video, merely to show off in terms of some ideas of how multi-screen can be used. So if you can run the short video, it might be helpful.
Continue. I think you saw a couple of different use cases on the video. You, you saw how people were able to share a, a Twitter feed as they're watching a sports game just by you know, flicking it to the screen. Uh, you, you saw video conferencing and video chat happening. You saw multiplayer games with two people using their phones as a controller and controlling you know, a game on the TV. This is just a, a start, and the good news is what you saw here are actual live demos um, built on top of our multi-screen platform that you know, Samsung released last year. Right. Um, you know, one of the topics that people have talked about a lot for the last few years is this idea of the second screen. Um, but I feel as though we're still in the nascent phases of really bringing that to the mainstream and finding use cases. Is that something that you've experienced yourself when talking to developers? Oh yeah, I think um, you know, the whole multi-screen is, is really in the early phases. I think most people think of multi-screen as, I'm watching a movie here, I just want to see it on my TV and make that easy. But I think um, you know, my experience you know, trying a lot of second screen experiences is you get a neck ache by sort of going back and forth Constantly. between your yeah. phone, your tablet, and your TV. I think consumers um, want, want more than that, more than just being able to mirror what they see on their tablet on, onto their TV. So I think some of the examples you saw is creating this secondary experience, or in case when someone's watch, wearing a watch as they're watching TV too, mm -hmm. maybe even a third screen experience that really augments um, you know, the TV experience, tablet experience, and watch. And so in a sense, it's like completely rethinking that experience, right? Because you, you can, for example, use your tablet as a remote control, but perhaps that's not necessarily what you want to do. You can take it further than that. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, since we uh, have uh, TVs and other devices, we learn a lot. I mean, we tried developing a couple years ago just an electronic remote control, as I was telling you, and found out that uh, a physical remote control is a lot faster to change a channel. And even though you had super rich content on, you know, a, uh, on your tablet, you know, actors' information and all that, just the, the fact that you want to get to the, your content as fast as possible, we had to kind of rethink how do you actually create a remote EPG, remote control that actually is better experienced than the physical, you know, very low cost uh, remote control device. Mm -hmm. So it becomes much more of an interactive experience, not just a utilitarian, I'm changing the channel, but I'm also learning about what's going on on that other screen. Yeah, I think um, you know, people in Silicon Valley, they're, they're probably more tolerant of lots of information. But I think for us, we have to figure out how do you get rid of all of the number of steps to actually get to what you want. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the example I gave you is, you know, imagine using your tablet and you had no other remote control and all you want to do is change your channel. Today's world, you know, you have to first find your tablet, turn it on, you know, do your PIN, mm -hmm. the password, find the application, launch the application, oh, then change the channel. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like four, five steps. That's a lot of friction. So I think, you know, uh, as technologists, we have to constantly look at how do you reduce all that friction mm -hmm. but still provide value. And the, and the magic is finding that right balance between added value and utility, right? Right. Right, because ultimately, so long as it's still easier to use a remote control and you're not, but it's about the trade-off, right? What am I gonna get for that extra few right. steps I have to take? Having said that, that connectivity between the different devices, the, the plumbing that goes underneath that um, to make that seamless is part of your pitch to developers as well, right? Sure. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, as someone once told me, uh, the best ideas come from outside your company and, um, I think as a you know, company like Samsung, we have to provide sort of the plumbing, the, you know, the hardware and software infrastructure to really let developers sort of come up with the, the next great idea or the next great, next, next best thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've been really doing is, is creating the, this multi-screen platform that allows developers to really um, experiment, create things super fast using HTML, JavaScript, making sort of the pairing between your devices totally seamless um, and making that, uh, again, for the consumer, uh, you know, the best possible experience. So they don't even have to do anything or really know what's going on underneath. Yeah. It's, just, it's just working for them, right? Yeah, I mean, already, um, uh, once you pair your phone to your t uh, Samsung TV, you don't have to pair again. Right. It, it, it sort of knows that each other are in proximity mm -hmm. and 
the phone can tell the TV, automatically launch an application. Mm -hmm. Or the TV can even tell the phone, automatically launch an application. Mm -hmm. So the consumer doesn't have to really think about all these things. Okay, I have to do this on this. I have to launch this app on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to make that totally as transparent and easy as possible. And the more seamless it is, the easier it is to make that pitch to consumers. Yep. Um, you know, you shouldn't have, rather than have an iPad and, an, and a Samsung um, Galaxy phone, have a tab with that phone. Yeah, I mean, uh, ultimately, you know, we want to create experiences that consumers say, you know, I, within that Samsung ecosystem, man, you can do a lot, and experiences are just so easy and fantastic. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we saw some examples, of the demos that were on the video. Can you give us some other insights into other services you've seen from the developer community that's working with Samsung here in the Valley that kind of stood out to you, that wowed you a little bit, maybe? Yeah, there's, there's some funny stuff. I mean, I've seen that, you know, sometimes it's hard for me to judge what's good and what's mm -hmm. not good, because sometimes the, the craziest stuff seems to take off. But, um, you know, we're talking to a, uh, a company that does, you know, makes pizzas and, home, and does home delivery. And, uh, you know, people will actually order the pizza on their phone, and then they're watching, you know, Golden State Warriors game, and then they want to track how, how much time is it going to take for the pizza to arrive. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there's an application now that shows it right on your Samsung TV and says, you know, Mike is actually making the pizza. Oh, now it's in Joe's truck out for delivery, and it's two minutes away. <laughs> so, you know, things like that are very simple to do. And sometimes you never know what consumers are going to love. But that's the beauty of having a platform that people can be very creative on. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking about the, the watch earlier. We know that Samsung's also getting into, you've got the Gear Fit. And so health, and mm. monitoring health is going to yeah. be an important part of um, the kind of services that Samsung also can provide um, through its devices, through the developers who work with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing with electronic health? Sure, um, you know, I spent the last year kind of learning about sort of the, what's going on in, in North America for health. Obviously, I think we all know uh, most North Americans, we can do better, uh, both technology-wise, but also getting people motivated to, to, you know, walk even, or, or exercise for 10 minutes a day. So I think, um, you know, we have incredible amounts of sensors now. If you look at our gear, Two and our Gear Fit, which started shipping last week, you know, the, both actually have a heart rate monitor built in, right into the wristband, and um, it uses a green LED, so it actually can look under your skin, so you can be walking and can, all, you know, be monitoring your your heartbeat. But getting all that data is one thing, but then the question is, how do you motivate people right. with all that data? So, you know, the one motivation obviously is if you can get a $200 a month discount on your healthcare plan, mm -hmm. I bet you people will be motivated. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're kind of beginning to see now is sort of merging of, of data collection with sort of healthcare costs, and there's going to be companies in between. Uh, hopefully, maybe some of you guys are the next startup company who has the next great idea. But I think that's where the connection is going to be made, and that's where consumers, at least in North America, will begin to see, okay, if I walk 30 minutes a day, I get to save $50 a month on my healthcare you actually may see people actually being motivated that way. And then with triggers coming out on your watch, it vibrates, it tells you during your day, please just walk 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. You might actually do that. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And this is, seems to have been the big uh, challenge that wearable devices till now have been facing. It's you know, the news about Nike, Nike Fuel Band, um, case in point. Um, how do you motivate people to actually continue wearing these things? And to an extent, you need that third party yeah. who's kind of pinging you and that other reason that it's not just for you collecting your own data and looking at it, but it kind of affects some other part of your life as well. Yeah, I think Nike did a good job of sort of trying to provide motivation and using the social mm -hmm. to see how you're doing against your friends. Yeah, the point system. Yeah, I think the next step is, again, an economic one. Right. <laughs> right, if you can link that in somehow, that may actually get people more, even more motivated. People care about how much they're paying for health insurance a little bit more than how many steps they right. actually walk per day, you could say. Um, I'm curious about your thought on kind of getting a little bit philosophical here and the definition of the screen and looking at perhaps a little, peeking around the corner and looking at the fu future a little bit. Um, you know, as we start to have more of these kinds of wearable devices and other types of devices in the home and the internet of things, 
um, more processing going on, perhaps on the band that's on our wrist or the glasses that we wear. Uh, do you think what we have on our, right now as a smartphone, could that ever be relegated to just a dumb screen? It becomes just a display while the processing happens on other devices everywhere else. Or do you think this will always, the smartphone as it exists, this kind of rectangular brick will always be the, the kind of computer that you carry, the, the, the mothership as it were? So I'll give you my personal view, and maybe not Samsung's view. Um, you know, I, I think people' ex expectations of devices are growing more and more every year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the challenge we have is um, how do you continue to innovate to meet consumer consumers' uh, expectations? Um, and um, I think with wearables, you know, that that's uh, I think it's going to be sort of your identity on the move with you all the time, right? People tend to wear their watch uh, everywhere. They're taking your smartphone everywhere as well. But sort of my view is, you know, if you're in your house and you have your, your smartwatch on you, this is your identity. And all of the products you interact with in your house should know it's you, right? Mm -hmm. If you're front of, in front of your um, Samsung refrigerator, your refrigerator, Radio Chanel, it's Curtis Sasaki about to open the refrigerator, right? And what could it tell me that could be an interesting? If you're about to, uh, you know, turn on your TV, it should, the TV should know it's me sitting in front of the TV. So maybe my programming guide should be customized to me. Mm -hmm. and I shouldn't have to even touch any buttons. You should, you should sort of be aware of that. So I think that's, you know, maybe one of the things we begin to see is, you know, people's identity being used in more intelligent, smarter ways without having the user to do everything themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's about kind of existing in the cloud as opposed to any one device. Yeah, I mean, I think um, clearly the cloud has a big play here mm -hmm. because, you know, all devices sort of connect into the cloud with all of the data um, and uh, we have to provide services that make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we've got a little bit more time left. Maybe we can just talk about um, how Samsung reaches out to developers here. Um, you know, it, it, being a company that is based overseas as opposed to in Silicon Valley, although you have a presence here, um, how has that evolved in terms of how Samsung is trying to reach out a little bit more proactively sure. to developers? Yeah, I mean, um, since I joined Samsung, there's been incredible amounts of change just in the Valley, and I've, I've been in Samsung a little bit less than three years. So, you know, Samsung's a very big company, as you said, and in the past, you know, a startup company would say, I just met with the fifth Samsung executive. <laughs> and that's not a good thing, right? Um, yes, we love developers, but we have to be coordinated in terms of how we actually, you know, work with companies. So in, in, in the Valley, we have, uh, you know, lots of uh, research labs uh, doing everything from, you know, touch screen, R&D, flat panel displays, computer science, microprocessors, graphic processing. We have all that already in, in San Jose and Silicon Valley, but we also have um, an accelerator in downtown Palo Alto and University where if anybody here comes up with some fantastically cool idea and you want to incubate it uh, within a Samsung facility, we have that ability now. We do uh, a lot of investments uh, in, in here as well as acquisitions. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, with all of the different teams here, we, we uh, are working really hard to coordinate amongst each other. So, you know, try to have one face of the developer community, um, as well as, you know, my team provides technical support if a developer wants to take advantage of, you know, our, our smart pen. Okay. So all this, all this uh, we can do locally here. Okay, great. Wonderful, well, that's uh, bang on the dot. We're finished with our, yep. our time's up. Perfect. So, Curtis, thank you very much. This is really thank you. interesting. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.